Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into a shot that I think enters an area a lot of people struggle with, and that is overpowering daylight. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Braslin. I've got a great show lined up for you today. I'm, I'm quite excited, actually, about the topic matter and the, the photo that we are going to dissect. For those of you that are new to the show, uh, on Behind the Shot, we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, meaning dissecting that shot from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. And, and basically, the idea is to try and understand why they made the choices that they did in making that particular shot. I do want to remind you that if you are looking for the show notes or any links that we talk about or any links related to my guest, of course, you can always get those at the website at behindtheshot.tv. If you want to follow me, it's stevebrazel.com. We'll talk about my socials uh, uh, coming up a little bit later. One other thing I want to let you know about is if you are watching on YouTube, all those links are on YouTube as well. They're right down below the subscribe button and the like button. And if you would hit like, it would be much appreciated while you do that. In fact, those of you that are watching uh, in a podcast feed or listening in a podcast feed, a quick tip for you. So Behind the Shot is available wherever you get your podcasts in two formats. There's two feeds. If you search for Behind the Shot, there's an audio only version and a video version. If your podcast outlet of choice supports video, uh, it's a photography show. So video for some people is easier, but actually about 53% of the people listen to the audio only version. If you're listening to the audio only version, you can head to the website behindtheshot.tv. You can see any of the pictures that we're talking about. I've got two of them today because I got a behind the scenes one that you can see as well. So if you want to know what those look like, head to the website. And if you would, wherever you're getting that podcast, would you drop us a star rating and even better yet, a star rating and a written review? It helps with discoverability and I, I would appreciate it very, very much. So Let's get into today's guest. So for today's guest, somebody introduced me to this guy. And as soon as I saw his work, and, and usually when people do that, they say to me, here's a guy I think would be a good guest. And most of the time I look at it and think, yeah, they'd be a good guest. And then I looked at Will Kadena's site and went, hell yeah, let's get Will on the show. Will, how are you? I am living the dream. Let's put it that way. Very uh, blessed. <laughs> and you're living the dream in New York when there's no snow. Surprisingly, you know what? It's kind of chilly. I just got back from your your city, your neck of the woods, and right. it was chilly there. And I was hoping to get some kind of tanning, you know, with the Latino ness. But yeah. no, it didn't get it didn't get dark at all. So yeah. Well, <laughs> and the funny thing is, I have Portuguese blood in me, and so the rest of my family is darker. I, I always think it's because I'm the fourth that my mom ran out of color. But <laughs> either either way, it it. Uh, it is what it is. So let's let's talk about you for a second. For those of you again new to the the YouTube channel or more, you know, specifically the podcast, we dive deep into a photo. But I always like to start with a bit of an introduction to my guest, so that you have a chance to understand who Will is if you don't already know. And I don't tend to run it like an interview. It's more of a conversation be between Will and I. And and I got to tell you, when kind of like I said in the beginning in the intro, when you were mentioned to me first by our mutual friend. Uh, and I went and looked at your site. Your portfolio kind of caught me off guard. You literally seemingly can shoot anything from cinematography to commercial work, to corporate events, to weddings, to bar and bat mitzvahs. If you had to choose only one, I would like to nail people down on this. I mean, you're, oh, you're multi-talented <laughs> clearly, but I'll, I'll go with the desert island analogy. If you okay. were on a desert island and you could only photograph one subject... What would you pick? Ah, uh, that's hard, man. Like on a desert island. Yeah, because like, there there may not be a wedding on the desert <laughs> island, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe on a desert island, maybe clouds. I guess you know. I think. I know but it's of the weird, genres but... you normally shoot. Ah, oh, um, I think probably most likely um, corporate branding. I love corporate branding. I really got more into it in the last five years, six years or so. So. Okay, yeah, let me let me let me dive into that. Corporate photography people understand. Commercial mm -hmm. photography people understand. You added the word branding in. So for those yeah. people going, what exactly does he mean by corporate branding? Explain. So uh, uh, we can't mention the company's name, but you know sometimes companies bring it. There's there's a difference between corporate headshots, um, portfolios inside of it. So how can we monopolize as much as we can within that business? So instead of just doing the typical headshots, is like maybe we can incorporate something with LinkedIn, 
um, some instead of just typical headshots, straight on headshots, it'll be maybe horizontal shots with wording on it. It's like no different from, you know, Instagram with those entrepreneurs that have the shots like this. I think there's one shot of me like this and there's wording on the sides uh, right. from there. No different from like real estate photography. Um, it's something becoming really new for the corporate world. Um, and also that's another way to tap into different circles like, you know, like a CEO that we photographed originally was headshots and it led into family sessions and then it led oh. into, um, then it led into, uh, their daughter's wedding. So everything I go into is always, it leads, it has to lead into something else. Um, and to see the opportunities that could benefit the client and also benefit us in every way. So I like to be more of the long-term working relationship or family photographer in that way. It's kind of interesting because yeah. what you just described, you're basically doing uh, you're doing your own spec work as actual paid jobs, right? You right. do the corporate yeah. thing, even though it's a paid job, it's also spec for, hey, I can do your family thing. I, I That's a business lesson right there. I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's how I got into the commercial and corporate world is through wedding photography. Because uh, if you really think about it, yes, they come into you as a bride and groom, but now what do they do for a living? And that's one of the biggest things is, it's not like I just go into just photographing the wedding. I get to know our clients very well, not just the bride and groom, but also their parents, their siblings. And now we become more of a kind of like an ecosystem in that way. And that's the goal, just like Mac. You know, they have <laughs> that the uh, the you know the iPads, the MacBook Pros, the the TVs. So it's kind of hard to leave that ecosystem if we're so immersed in it. So that's always the goal. So more business than, than anything else. The uh, the other thing I was noticing when I when I was kind of researching you is you are a sought after speaker and you have spoken at almost every that I can think of, uh, you know, well-known photo thing. G give people some of the idea of the, some of the places you've done speaking. Yeah, I have the honor of speaking uh, anywhere between WPPI. Um, also our judge for international print competitions. Um, I've spoken in Europe. I've spoken at uh, the Fundy uh, workshop in Disney World, which is pretty cool. Uh, I still to this day do, do not consider myself a speaker. I just, I teach in what I do. Uh, that's the most important thing, especially what's going on now. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about what you used to do, but the question is, what are you doing now? What are you doing after COVID? What are you doing after, you know, what, you know, what did you do different from last week to now? So it's constantly updating, uh, adjusting to, you know, what's going on in the world and, and see if you could solve issues or problems that a client that, that might have to lead into different opportunities. So I'm always looking for the opportunities one way right. or another. But yeah, so I spoke in different places. I'm speaking in Greece next year, which I'm excited about. Um, I spoke in that, the Canon Learning Center in California. Um, also right by me, by the way. Yeah, really, really close, which I was just You there. did. <laughs> did you not do Photo Plus and Imaging USA too? Uh, yes, I've done uh, imaging, uh, Photo Plus. Uh, this year, the, I think it's called Photo X, which is cool. This would be something different. So, yeah, honestly, I can't even keep track in places where I spoke at. But it's really an honor because, you know, you get to share your knowledge. And, and still to this day, I'm always going to workshops. I'm always learning. I'm always learning from other people. There's always something to learn. I think there's several educators that I have taken their workshops well over seven to eight times, like Roberto Verlazuela. Cause there's always, you go, it's like watching a movie, you watch a movie, then you watch it again and you start seeing little things that you didn't see before. And those little bits and pieces go such a long way. And so, yeah, so I'm always kind of constantly learning, going to workshops, conferences, and, and I learned so much from the attendees as well from teaching. So it's really, really cool. So. So you yeah. mentioned Roberto Valenzuela and Roberto was on the show and and that's exactly how I felt in the time. The little bit of time I had to talk to him for, for the show was he would say something, you know, I'm, I'm going to make numbers up here. He'd say something 15 minutes in, but then 30 minutes in, he would say something that reminded me of what he said 15 minutes in. And it all just kept building on top of each other, which I think as a speaker is, is, um, I, I think that's a skill more people need. And I don't know that it was even conscious on his part, but it so worked for me absorbing it. With you doing what you do, I took a look at your client list. And again, it's top tier clients. Name some of the companies, if you can, if you can't, I have them written down and I'll name them. Name <laughs> some of the companies uh, that you've worked for. Yeah, I've done work with the United Nations, UBS Financial. I mean, still to this day, it's, it's not like their past clients. Um, uh, Project Runway. Uh, I mean, I could go on with the list, but 
uh, yeah, I'm just very blessed. And it's funny because I updated my prof- my portfolio, my bio recently, and I was like, oh my god, there's there's so many amazing, you know, uh, amazing journey adventures that I you know that led into so many opportunities. And that's the thing, like you never know who you might meet, whether it's the bathroom attendant or you meet someone at an Uber or Lyft that might you know recommend you. I had a client, I had. A bathroom attendant at the Plaza Hotel that I was always nice to. Uh, if you guys don't know what the Plaza Hotel is from Home Alone, ah, uh, you know. Right, that, right. So always nice to the guy. And one day, one of his family members contacted us and, hey, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, Luis, and he spoke so highly about you. And you know, uh, we were hoping to do our daughter's wedding. And I was, you know, I thought nothing of it. I'm like, absolutely. You never know who you're going to meet. And one thing led to another. And they ended up getting me into to work at the United Nations because and never thought in a million years I'll be working there. And then from there, I ended up photographing the prime minister of Japan. And, and again, it became like a domino effect. Yeah. So it's kind of like, wow, it was like, you just never know. And and I think these days, you know, just being kind or just saying hello, it doesn't matter what it is, even the waiter, just say hello, just be be kind. Um, that's my biggest thing. Just be kind and social and down to earth if you can. Um, but yeah, so. It's amazing to me. So in what I do, music photography, it's all about relationships, right? You you, yeah. you don't have to be the greatest photographer to go on tour. You have to be the photographer yeah. they're willing to live in a bus with, right? To, yeah. to an extent. They want good photography. Don't misunderstand me. But yeah. that's a huge, important part of it. And it's it comes down to be a good human. You know, some of the companies I had listed, uh, FJ Westcott, Think Tank Photo, Synology. I've got one sitting here behind me. Sakonic. I've got a Sakonic meter. I, I've, I've got many Think Tank photo bags. Uh, you mentioned Shinzo Abe, but also Johnny mm-hmm. Depp, Derek Jeter, Michael Bloomberg. You've done a lot. So let's get into let's yeah. get into some photography stuff here. Shoot. When I look through your portfolio, your images, all your images have an amazing sense of space from rich colors and light. It creates to me in my mind a, a sense of area of space of envelopment almost in the photo is that the product of the scenes that you photograph or is that a kind of a goal of yours from day one uh you, you know in the in the beginning it used to always be about the hero shot or capturing this whole element and the subject being really really small um these days it just it becomes like a little bit more second nature uh, the goal is to really capture the client and who we're photographing whether it's a portrait or, or lingerie shoot or headshots or you know environmental shot um as you notice everything is very very sharp because i'm shooting anywhere between f11 to f16 and sometimes f22 uh that's more my style of shooting um again everyone shoots differently these days i try to keep it very simple if you ever look at my metadata, I'm sure you have the info uh, regarding the shot we'll be, we'll be speaking about. I don't go higher than shutter speed 200. That's not my thing. Uh, I know people like to shoot, you know, 1,000, 8,000 of a second. For me, it's it's never been about that because I actually started during the film days, believe it or not. Uh, I know uh, I may look young, uh, but I started when I was 13. I wasn't going to say it, <laughs> but when you said that, I'm sitting in my head thinking, Really? Yeah, yeah. So I started through my family business. Um, I have two uncles. One's a, a wedding and portrait uh, uh, photography studio in New York City. And I have another uncle that's a, a commercial fashion photographer. So I kind of was born into that circle. So it, it was either that or, you know, be a bad boy or go be a break dancer. And another thing that you might not, might not know about me is I used to dance professionally. <laughs> So, so during that time, my uncle used to take me on, you know, during the summertime to go assist as a double light assistant during the uh, film days. And I got to admit, I was a little spoiled because my uncle used to shoot medium format, Hasselblad. So when I actually started slowly graduating from a, uh, from a bag holder, then becoming a double light assistant. And then from there, uh, graduating to a first assistant, which we had to know how to use a light meter, how to set up the lighting. And, you know, I'm blessed because these days when, you know, we take a shot, we could see it right then and there. We had to wait two weeks to three weeks to see the image if we got it or not. So before we even graduated to shooting, we had to know exactly the exposure and the composition and the fundamentals of photography. And and eventually it got to being a uh, main assistant, which which that really means is managing the team and also setting up the camera, lighting, everything. All you had to do was literally 
have it set for the main photographer to come in and just press the trigger and direct the right. client. So my uncle and my uncles train, trained us in that way to get to that level. And still to this day for my team members, I do the same thing. Uh, because, you know, these days, you know, there's a lot of talented photographers out there, which some stuff is just mind blown. I don't even know what they're taking in order to get those shots or I, I want to get on those pills or whatever it is or those energy drinks. Um, but the biggest thing is for me to sell my team members, I need to make sure they they follow the criteria and to get the certain shots that we sell for, especially if you're doing multiple crews that go out. So, but uh, yeah, that's how I learned. And um, I kind of like, was sidetracked from your question is, um, yeah, actually, bring me back to that question again. I'm kind of sidetracked. This thing just, just you, so. so you have yeah. this, a lot of your stuff is location type shooting and you Very. have this amazing sense of space. So let me actually approach it differently because, yeah. because this may, this may get us into all of it. What are the keys to, for, for people who aren't comfortable going on location, mm. What is, if you were to pick the main key, like if you were to tell somebody, if you do nothing else, yeah, there's 50 tips I could give you, but if you do nothing else, do this one. What is the the one main key to a successful location shoot? Uh, you know what? It's, 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 that's a great question. Um, before it used to be, for me, years ago, it used to be about location. Then it became lighting. Then it became, you know, styling. Then it became... For me personally, these days is capturing that emotion and bring, bringing out the emotion from the subject. Uh, and yes, I'm not saying those other elements are not important, uh, but these days for me is really bringing out the emotion because what I really sell these days is emotion. Um, you know, then from emotion is also the lighting, then the posture, the posing, and then it leads into leading lines, composition. Most importantly, composition for me is is really a key factor. I feel like uh, I always done. Even though it's basic rule of thirds, uh, if you look at a lot of my photographs, uh, the subject is always positioned in some way or another in the rule of thirds, uh, if I could try and get it, even for horizontal or vertical shots in some way or another. Um, but I think really for me, and it's really more emotion these days, and this is for this week. Who knows? It might change next week, you know, to something else. So, But that's the beauty part about this industry and in our, in our career or in photography in general, videography is you interpret it in your own vision, in your own mind, which, you know, you could put, you know, you could put one, you could put 10 people in a room with the same exact gear, same exact exposure, but everyone, everyone's going to get something completely different. And that's the beauty part about being in this industry. And I don't think that's, yeah. that's addressed enough. You know, people are, uh, I, I've known people who are, I don't want to use the word scared, scared is the wrong word, <laughs> but I, but I know people that are apprehensive of sharing their info or whatever. Like you could, you could give two people, the exact same camera on a brand they don't shoot with a subject they've never shot and lighting they've never used. And they could be pros. They would figure out how to use it and they'd still get completely different shots. Um, it, 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 it's a, it's interesting to me. Again, you, you just, you create this sense of space and what you said about the rule of thirds intrigues me because the shot we're going to talk about today, the subject quote unquote is on a rule of third, but yeah. your layers are on rules of third. So, and, and what you said about you're using, you know, small apertures like 11 or even 22, the, the background subject in today's shot, when we get to it, people, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, even the background part of this shot is on a different rule of third and in focus. It, very, very interesting. So before we bring up the shot, just a reminder to everybody, the podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, two formats, audio only, or video if the outlet of choice supports video. And of course, all the video also goes up, goes up on YouTube. It doesn't always make sense for YouTube, I'll be honest with you, because it's a podcast first and foremost, and YouTube tends to want, you know, 10, 15 minute videos and move on. So 45 minutes to an hour doesn't always work there. But if you like what you're seeing, head on down, hit like, I would appreciate it. And of course, all the links and everything are down there as well. So uh, oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, and that is I do want to thank my friends over at DVE Store for the high def video. That is very kind of them. It's dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And let's get into today's photograph. So before we do, this photograph when I saw it, so we went through a bunch of different photographs. And this photograph when I saw it hit me on a couple of levels as far as things I think, A, people can learn from, 
and B, and arguably more importantly, that people can just look at and admire <laughs> and enjoy from, from an artistic point of view. Uh, do you have a name for this shot? Um, actually, I don't. Um, you know, it's funny because I was going to I was going to submit this photograph for print competition. And I have to think think of something. But uh, yeah, I guess I'll let you know in the next few days. <laughs> so I got to submit it. Was this for a certain client? Yeah, so it was actually for a bridal company and based out of New York uh, City and uh, and also obviously with a designer. Um, so I originally wasn't, I like to, I like to take at least one or two projects a year and personally myself just go and do it. It, it kind of just recharges my mind and, and, you know, going back to what you stated before, you know, with the settings and exposure, one thing I love about your show is you you really talk about the theory behind everything. And I think that's one thing because, yes, you could give the, you know, the settings on the gear and what, what kind of equipment to get. And but no one talks about how they got the shot or no one really what is the reasoning behind it. So for me, I wanted to go away, recharge my batteries. And I figured, you know what, let me reach out to a, a client of mine and they were all about it. And one thing led to another, you know, the makeup artists and hairstylists wanted to, wanted to take part. And, and that's one of the beauty part about being in the industry is that you build up, you build these great relationships and everyone wants to be part of this project with you. And again, it, it was originally was supposed to be a basic shoot and now it ended up becoming like a real commercial campaign shoot. So they, uh, yeah. The, this was your concept though. The, so, cause you said yeah. you approached them with it and they were all on board. So this entire I don't want to use the word design here either, but you know what I mean? The The concept yeah. of what I'm looking at here was yeah. yours. Yeah. Not an so, art director's. No, no, no. So that's one okay. thing. And, and I'm sure you, you could agree because you're, you're on site and you're photographing these cool, you know, amazing shows. And, you know, if you had the ideal budget if, or, if, or if you had the ideal, uh, you know, vision to do something, you know, I can ask you the same question. What would you do if there was unlimited budget for you to, right. to set up something? Well, you know, you're on that desert island. <laughs> a limit. Uh, what, no. would you, what would be your idea or goal to do something cool and epic? Go. Right. You got 20 seconds. Go. Okay. So for me, it would probably yeah. be to uh, have all the band members jumping out of an airplane. I'm making this up as I go. Jumping out of an airplane, playing instruments, including the drums, while they were falling to earth. Sick. When are you doing this? When's your right. ideal goal? Yeah, it's, I got to make this happen. This is about you, you man. This is all about you. We got to, we got to <laughs> get, is, we gotta... <laughs> but it's about us because I want to be there <laughs> capturing you, what you do. And that's the goal. So, uh, as I think you're, you can tell, all right, I like to encourage other people. I want them to fill, fulfill their visions and more. And that's always the goal. So for me, it's the same thing. How can I push myself? How can I get myself, um, not to stay comfortable? you know, pushing yourself the limits to do something different or unique. So for me, I really did a lot of homework. I did reach out to a few friends of mine to help me at, to help me find a really great location in Texas. And they helped me find this location. And I kind of, kind of, you know, whiteboarded everything to a certain degree. Um, just like anything else, there's always going to be detours and, you know, bumpy roads in order to get to this, to this level. Because originally, we were supposed to start shooting about eight in the morning, around seven forty-five or eight in the morning. The downside of it, after getting the permits or something happens, so supposedly I'm not mentioning any names, but the certain state, uh, certain state and uh, park <laughs> department <laughs> did not submit something at a certain time, and it it delayed everything. So we officially started shooting around one thirty something, I think PM. I have to. I'm sure it's in the main. So this data. is this is literally midday sun, which which you oh. can see. You know, yeah. or, or afternoon sun, which you can see from the light position. Real, real quick, before we dive into the shot anymore, yeah. looking at the EXIF data of this image, I see that it was shot at ISO 200, or actually, excuse me, ISO 100, F16, 200th of a second at 28 millimeters, 5D Mark IV body with a 24 to 70 2.8 Mark II, which is an amazing lens. I love that lens. Yeah. Uh, again, 5D Mark IV. So... Was this looking at this? You're at f16 at ISO 100, uh, two hundredth of a second. I'm guessing this is really bright. Oh my god! Oh my! It was so bright you couldn't even you couldn't even see. Like I was shoot, photographing this with sunglasses on. That's how bright it was. I couldn't even see the screen. And again, this is like oh, more experience. I, I have to interrupt you. I apologize. <laughs> Somebody's going to leave a yeah. bad comment about me on this, but that's okay. Because yeah. I got to know, you can shoot with sunglasses. See, I can't. If I have sunglasses on, even when it's daylight and I'm looking through a viewfinder or at live view, it changes yeah. what I see so much. I adjust. That doesn't really? affect you using sunglasses? 
No, you know, you know, I get that question asked a lot at workshops because sometimes when I teach workshops, I'm outside. One, my eyes are very sensitive. Two, I already know. Again, like just like anything else, I'm I'm sure everyone out there is like, you know, more you do it, it becomes more of experience wise. Um, I already know during that time of the day, even if I light meter it, I'll bring it to a range where I want it to be. I, I already know what I'm going to get, like kind of like the sunny 16 rule. Um, if you're outside, you know, I think the old school terminology was like shutter speed 200, ISO 200, I have 16. So obviously digital is a little bit more, a little bit more sensitive than that. So I automatically dropped, dropped it down to ISO 100, shutter speed 200, I have 16. That was, I already knew, it's going to get me to where I want to be, even though I can't see and I'm sweating like crazy. So I already know that's, that's going to be my overall exposure in general. Um, now the flash situation i don't know if you want to get into that situation yet, okay but, let, let's hold yeah. the flash let's hold the flash because <laughs> yeah. you just said okay, something yeah. that just made me want to yeah. want to say something you're yeah. sweating so i'm guessing that this young lady is dying as well although oh. she's barely oh, yeah. wearing anything but still i'm guessing she's out there going can we get this done so i can get in the shade oh yeah so that was another it was like a hundred and i think it was like a hundred and four 504 degrees. It was something insane. And I, I was, come on, like guys, you know, you've been out there when you're sweating, you're going in your eyelashes, you can't see. Now you're thinking about, oh my God, this girl's going to melt. So some of these shots were purposely shot a little wider, not to be <laughs> shoot tight because she was pretty much almost melting already. So we kept her in the shade and my assistant was shading her before we started shooting her with the, with the Westcott. Uh, I think I had the Westcott, uh, I think it was a medium or large switch box I had w with the modifier. So when we weren't shooting her, we had to cover her up really, really quick uh, with that. Uh, and also another thing, we had her off to the grass because that concrete, that floor was burning. I mean, it was generating so much heat that was reflecting back into her. So we had to keep her shaded within that time frame. Okay. So these shots, yeah, th it probably took no more than, not over exaggerating, maybe thirty seconds to do because any more than that, we would have she would have been done, melted, and realistically, I hate sweating, so I was I was pretty much all done already. <laughs> all right, so, I, yeah. I, let me let me do this. Uh, yeah. I want to get into that behind the scenes type stuff, where the light okay. is, why you put it, where you, all of that in a second. But first of all, for yeah. those of you that are listening to the audio feed. You can't see the picture, right? So for those of you on the audio feed, I'm going to describe the picture for you really quickly. This one is, this is an interesting one. Some shots I have difficulty doing this. And this shot, I don't know that I'll have that hard of a time. It's landscape orientation. It's it's more of a standard 4-3 type ratio to it. But, you know, so think landscape image, right? And I want you to literally think landscape image. Like if this model wasn't there, this is a landscape shot. It's a shot of an old uh, you know, old stone brick type church. Um, the, there's a concrete dirt road that's going back. And here's what's brilliant about what I was saying on the rule of thirds. So this road takes up almost the full bottom of the frame, except a little bit of grass on the right. But the road, the, the, the right side of the road goes straight back. So you have that little bit of grass on the right, go all the way back with the road. But the left side of the road, because the angle that Will chose to shoot this, that one goes perspective, starts on the far left corner of the image, just a hair above the, the bottom left corner of the image. And it goes all the way back, but to the right. And the road ends around the bottom right rule of third. The model is on that rule of third, but she's way up in the foreground of this road, just a, her feet are a little bit above the bottom of the road. If that's all you picture in your head with grass on the right side of the road, grass on the left side of the road, but again, that one, the, the road itself doing a perspective disappearing into the bottom right rule of third, and then a beautiful, and I'm gonna stress this, natural blue sky with clouds, clouds at the bottom horizon, like just above the tree line, not so much at the top, but natural is key here. It's not overpushed. It's not overprocessed. And you can see a sun kind of halo and light beams coming from exactly in the upper right-hand corner. If that's all you picture, you've got it, except there's more. Wait, there's more. Uh, wait, it's it's more. <laughs> an old world South American style church that's on the left rule of third. And you're looking at the front of it. So you got the door in the middle. You got a round window above the door. Uh, it's almost castle-like looking. And the right side of it, the turret goes up higher for the bell tower, right? Old stone, worn face, all of that type stuff. And the bottom 
horizon of the land, the church, the road, everything, that's the bottom rule of third. But the bell tower goes up dead center and the top of the church almost hits the top rule of third, right? Um, it's just so well done. And then you've got this model added in there. Beautiful model, short brown hair or tied back, one of the two, um, dressed in, it's almost lingerie wear. It could be a wedding dress, but it's almost lingerie wear that's ground, you know, full length, um, white, kind of see-through, mostly open, almost like a robe is a good way to describe it. But she's wearing high heels, gorgeous light, lighting. Now, her back is to the sun. The sun is coming from the back, upper right corner, like I said. And yet her face and her side are beautifully lit. Clearly, it's it's artificial light, but just absolutely amazing. So where is this, by the way? This is it's in uh, San Antonio. Uh, it's at the Missions. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you remember the model's name? Uh, I believe if not, that's Vanilla? fine. I just, if you do, I, she's, she's yeah. her, her, her body position is so brilliant here. Did you pose her or was this her actually, just walking? No, actually I did. So, um, you know, the, the, it's usually two or three steps. I'll tell them to go back and I want you to, you know, take a step forward just and but I had to also tell her to angle her head towards the light because obviously that's you know you want to light up the face very well. But it was like one or two steps, and we did it for maybe three or four times. Uh, and uh, once I felt like we got the shot, that was it. Um, because it, you know you always want to have the the body curved in some way or another. You also want to bend the arms slightly a little bit more. So instead of just having a person walk straight with the arms straight. It's just, right. there's no flow to it. So I wanted a little bit more flow. And believe it or not, this was actually my second choice. There was another shot of her that I liked a lot, but uh, as as where she was in the shot, but this has so much, it was so much, uh, I guess just the angle and the pose of her and how she was walking and the expression. Cause she's kind of like walking like she's badass. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, and you can interpret it however you wish. Uh, but for me, it was really important to capture more of an elegant, uh, she's, she's elegant almost, look of her. you're right. I can see mm -hmm. she's almost walking with a, with, with a swagger, like, yeah. like she owns this place. Uh, the lighting, I want to touch on the lighting, natural light yeah. coming from behind her. And here's, what's interesting. You're clearly lighting her with, with artificial light. We'll, I'll show the behind the scenes in a minute, but there is a very strong shadow in front of her on that concrete. Yeah. So that sun Screaming bright, throwing a very long, dark shadow. So explain to me, you're using this Westcott. You walk outside, you see this scene. You're almost shooting into the sun, just a little bit off angle from the sun. Before we touch on the light, you, the light position and everything, what goes through Will's mind as you look at daylight mid-afternoon and say bad words to yourself like this was supposed to be eight in the morning. I really didn't want to do this. Now I got to figure out, I got bright sun. I've got this gear with me. What goes through your mind to try and start thinking I got to overpower the sun? You know, you just had to. I mean, it's for me, it was realistically, you know, could I have put the light on the far left and use the, you know, the rim lighting from the sun and, yeah, I could have, but from from my, you know, I wanted to kind of treat it a little bit more, a little bit more natural. But you could kind of tell it was used strobe, because if I would have put the light on the far left, it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, because if you look at the building, you know, the highlight of the building is in the far right, which is the sun. So that's why I purposely put the light on the far right. And now regarding the shadows on the far left, yes, they're shadows. You know, it, you know the shot wasn't meant to be shot perfectly. It was a little bit more, more natural. Plus, I had so much of a film because light is reflecting off the off the floor. It's kicking back to her in a certain way. Um, and I already knew using you know using the, the 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 Canon camera, I knew how much of a dynamic range I I, I had to bring up some of the shadows. Okay. Um, and also, that, is that you know, a key thing to you usually? Yeah, you know what? It's just like anything else. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, you know, it's kind of like everyone has a license, you know, to drive. Does it, does it make them, you know, a race car driver? No. Uh, it's really understanding, you know, you know, your gear and what you use and, and how much you could push it. Um, 
But, uh, you know, there are times I could tell you right now, every job that I shoot, there's no such job I could go out and say it's a perfect job. You know, I always make mistakes. My team members, we all make mistakes in some way or another. There's mis- miscommunication. And but that's part of life. The question is, and, you know, how are you supposed to work around those detours or those those, uh, you know, those hiccups? And I can tell you right now, like, as I mentioned before, this job was there was a lot of hiccups. Um, you know, we could look at an image and critique, you know, the crap out of it and like, well, you could have done this. You could have done that. Yeah, but you weren't in there. So, you didn't know, the situation that we had. Right. So that, so when I look at someone's photographs or videos, you know, now, you, you know, you have to think why they shot in that way. You know, what were the complications? You know, what were the issues? So. Yeah, so the dynamic range really played a part for me. Uh, realistically, um, you know, was the was the building a lot darker? Yeah, w- was she a little darker on the shadow side? Yeah, absolutely. But I think I brought it up maybe twenty to thirty percent more of the shadows. Okay, and that was really it. I'm not really big into retouching and photoshopping. Uh, I think the behind the scenes shot I sent you that's pretty much all on camera. Um, the only thing I really t- you know tweak is really uh, more the color temperature and a little bit of the shadows, but. I try to keep it as as in camera as possible, and there's nothing wrong about doing post production. I personally, I just don't like to do it, and this is why I have my retouchers and uh, my team members do all that for me. But my biggest thing is try to capture as much as I can in camera, so now they have a great uh, image to play around with uh, to enhance. So, so this yeah. this behind the scenes one really does. I, I never thought about that until you mentioned it, and I'd seen the behind the scenes shot. But it does show you that the church is darker on that side. It shows you a little bit more of, like, for example, compared to her, look at the assistant, right? The assistant is complete, you know, almost silhouetted, not all the way by any means. You can see a shirt because it's white, but yeah. but there's completely dark, no detail almost. Whereas her, you can see that. By the way, the assistant's name. Do you know the assistant's name? Yeah, Joey. Joey is yeah, he's one of our amazing friend and talented team. Shout out to ours. Joey then. Yeah, uh, yeah so I give him a lot of credit. <laughs> so then you go <laughs> out there, and okay, sunny sixteen and all that. That's great for exposure, right? Mm-hmm. But looking at this, Joey's holding a light stand, you know, tripod with uh, a Westcott like Octobox on the top and a Westcott, whatever it is. Is this like a FJ four hundred or something or? So no, this is at at the time uh, Westcott did not have any strobes at that time. Uh, this is actually using an ELB five hundred Elecrone. Okay. So it's twelve hundred watts, and uh, yes, I'm using a modifier. Could I have shot it with hard light? Absolutely, but I still wanted to kind of like you know create that dreamy look to it a little bit, nice and soft. And I know the viewers out there, well, you're shooting hard light. It should be hard light. You know, it's a harsh time of day. You could, you know, it's it's a double edged sword, but. Again, at the end of the day, it's it's more the artistic view of how you want to capture it. See, so I look her, at this, yeah. and to me, the light is balanced just like I would want it. Like if she technically balanced light here, she wouldn't be any lit more than that church was in the in this behind the scenes shot. I mean, if you were to really balance it, and that'd be too dark, right? And if Correct. you look at the regular shot. Even with the church lightened, that still wouldn't be bright enough because now who's your subject should be the brightest. This is perfectly balanced to me. What is what is your mental workflow as you're standing here on the scene and you're thinking, okay, I can use Sunny 16. I've got this bright light. As you're trying to dial in your flash power and your flash distance, what is your mental workflow to balance this light? I mean, uh, the mental part of it is really... Um you know, I mean, to keep it really basic, you know, take a take a quick test shot, let's say if you don't have a light meter and see the exposure where you want to get it. So for me, is you know, I already know realistically it's shutter speed 200, uh, F11, um, you know, ISO um, 50 or 100. So I already know I don't want to have her so balanced with the background because if I do, it just blends in. Right. So this is why I purposely uh, brought it to F16 um, to have separation in her. And now the question is, you know, well, how do you know what exposure or, or what power to set on your flash? And again, this is just like, you know, either testing out the light beforehand, metering it, uh, like the old school days, or well, let me take that back. You know, when I was younger, how I was trained with Illumidon or Dynalites is 
set, you know, set the light five feet away from your subject or your, your, whatever you're photographing. So when I teach these days, I kind of teach the same way, you know, grab, you know, order five teddy bears. I'm sorry, order three teddy bears from wherever, wherever it is. It could be Amazon. I should, I should make an affiliate code for that because the amount of teddy bears I sell, you know, it'll be a white teddy bear, a brown teddy bear and a black teddy bear. So the question is, why would you want to have three different tones? Well, think about the skin tones. Right. So set that up five feet away, you know, and play with not even, I, let me take that back. You shouldn't be playing. You should be really locking down, you know, the, the exposure. So if you already know it's five feet away, ISO 100, let's say four, you know, four of a power of your, depending on your strobe that you're using, or that should determine on what, what the power is. So I already know with this about, you know, five feet away, if I put it uh, about power of nine, is going to give me that exposure. Um, so that's probably like a quick way, I guess, breaking it down, even though it gets really complicated. But that's okay. a quick way to cheat. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Could um, you have done this with speed lights? You'd need a lot of speed lights, right? Oh, absolutely. You could, uh, you, you know, the question is, well, you cannot, you know, you cannot power the sun, you know, for speed light. Absolutely, you can. Um, you know, this is where more the technical part of it, you know, uh, I know majority of people like to shoot high speed sync and wide open. Again, it's a style. It's, you know, realistically, I could have been five feet away, full power, one over one, depending on your speed light that you're using, uh, hard light, and I would have overpowered just like this with no problem. Um, now, could I have done it with that salt box? No, absolutely not. You will have to bring that salt box really close, about maybe one foot away, about one foot away from her, from her face. Saying yes, I would have got it, you know, overpowered, but you will get the salt box in there. So this is why sometimes it's nice to have the extra power. And so. and somebody said to me once, you know, to really overpower the sun from the same spot as uh, a strobe, you'd need probably four speed lights ganged together. Um, I've never tested that, but you know, again, yeah, par part, of the thing, can. part yeah. of the thing I love about this shot is, is her position in the frame. Like her head doesn't intersect anything. There's balance points in your mind between the church, between her, between the tree in the background with, with that road kind of going back like it does. You said that you're not huge, like you don't do a lot of processing. What, is, what software do you use when you process? Is it Lightroom, Photoshop, or? Yeah, no, I honestly, it's, uh, I download it, bring it into Lightroom and that is it. I mean, nothing okay. more complex than that. Um, the only thing I really did to this image besides the color temperature and bring up the shadows, I actually toned down the, uh, the, the blue in the sky cause it was too overpowering. I mean, the really? blue was so saturated. Yeah. It was, you know, I, if anything, I'll send you, I'll send you the, I'll, I guess I'll send you the image that, that was not the blue wasn't in there. The problem with that is the blue was so vibrant. It was taken away from her and it was taken okay. away from the, the, the temple of the church in the background. So um, it's just like anything else, it, you know, there, you know, if there's a part of an image, if it's too dark or too bright, your attention is going to go there. So that's what was happening with the blue sky. Yeah. So we we talk a lot down. about people's eyes go to the brightest spot in an image. The truth is it will also, if there's nothing to draw it more, It'll also go to one of the most saturated spots uh, in the Correct. image. Correct. This image to exactly. me, Will, really, there, there's so, so much beauty in this, and and part of what I love about it is that that um, juxtaposition of old and new. You have this beautiful young model with this beautiful gown, high heels, and then you have this old world scene. So just conceptually, I love this. Oh, you know what I wanted to ask? You, you we know you light in the church. Uh, yeah. you know, the shadow side of the church. Did you do anything individual to her with a, with an adjustment brush or anything, or it was just whatever you did? No, that's, that's it. Just positioning wow. where the light is. If you go to the B BTS of the shot, it's the height really plays a big difference on it. Um, if I, if, if I, when I had Joey just lower the light more, then the attention will go more towards her hips and her body. And if you really look at the image, you know, yes, you can look at the the satin of the dress. It looks like a little bit blown up, but believe it or not, there's a lot of detail on it. Now the question is, you know, well, what if we would have shot this just available light, you know, have more of that, you know, airy look to it. You could, but the thing is for my clients and what I, or my style of shooting is I like to have a lot of detail in, in our image. And also regarding, let's say this outfit, let's say the, the stylist hired us to do it. They spend a lot of time and money creating those details in that dress. Why would I want to blow, blow it out? 
It just doesn't make any sense. Um, it's like no different from me traveling to, you know, let's say I go to Paris and I tell everyone I'm photographing in Paris, but then I'm photographing a person in a brick wall the whole time. And you don't even know where you are, just that brick wall. Yes, the bricks are in Paris, but it doesn't make any sense. So whatever you shoot has to make sense of what you're doing. Um, You know, so, yeah. So, again, you know, I this was a little bit more of my vision, what I wanted to capture. It was a personal project, which led into not only a personal project, but it led into so much work in the aftermath was insane because the the designer was like, oh, my God. I'm like, would you be interested in traveling to Europe to do something, a campaign shoot for us? We love what you did with no budget. Now, can you do this with, you know, X amount? I'm like, absolutely. So um, what if we throw so money I'm at trying- you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, in a way, kind of, you know, in a way. You always got to negotiate in some way or another. Uh, but for these kind of shoots, it leads into so many opportunities. Even though it's re- I'm recharging, but it's also the goal is to create a, a solid portfolio. Uh, that it will lead into more work. And that's the goal. Um, You know, it's one thing about just constantly shooting, shooting, shooting by paid clients. But in order to get to where you want to be, you have to do personal project for yourself in order to get to that level. Um, Yeah. So I'm sure for you, I'm sure for you as well, when you go out, I'm sure there's certain things that, you know, you want to do and you just personally go out, you know, just to shoot on your own. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Charge. Time for a speed round. Uh Oh, these questions. Answer them just first answers that pop into your head, right? Okay. Your favorite location photography tip? (laughs) Uh, Never leave your bag behind you. (laughs) You It might get stolen. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Biggest mistake you made? Biggest mistake you almost made or made? Don't let a client dictate on how to run your business or how to change your format. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. I like that one. Okay. Yeah. You've, you've already mentioned rule of thirds. So let's leave that one. That one can't be used. Okay. Your favorite composition rule, if you have one. Bring the viewer where you want them to go. Oh, or so where good. you want them to look at. Yeah. So good. Favorite drink. Uh, 1942. Tequila, baby. I got a bottle out there. Have you had Class A Azul? <laughs> Of course. Yeah, of course. I like I, it. It's good. It's good. It's good. A nice presentation. You, you yeah, like the 42 really better? Too. For some reason. Yeah, probably. Maybe. I don't Interesting. know. Interesting. You yeah. and I got to get but, together. Okay. Yeah, we do we have to get, get together. together. Yeah. I got a bottle yeah. of both out there. Uh, ah, your right. favorite <laughs> band or artist? Um, That's hard. It, it all depends on my mood. Uh, I'm extreme. I like classical to hardcore rap to <laughs> vocal house music. So if I had to pick one right now, Bruno Mars, because he makes you want to dance. Nicest yeah. guy. I actually got to to shoot a meet Oh, you met him? him? That's so awesome. Yeah, I got to shoot. I mean, I didn't really meet him. I shot a meet and greet with him. Uh, but he was actually really, I've dealt with artists where I shoot a meet and greet and it's not the same. He was just yeah. wonderfully kind and amazing live. Uh, last question. Is there a photographer out there that you think more people should know about and follow? Oh my God, there's so many. Uh, that oh my God, there's so many. Do I have to get back to you right now on it? <laughs> you, you do not I have do. to. Yeah. Um, uh, so many cool European photographers out there. Uh, it's, it's hard. I'm sorry, guys, but it, it's hard. It is hard. And it's you know good. what? Majority, majority of them I don't know uh, personally, or I just I can't even pronounce the name. That's that's why I don't have. Uh, are they people so. the people that you would probably mention? Do you follow them on Instagram? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can send I can send Perfect. you that uh, definitely. Yeah. No, that, I've got your link already to Instagram, and I've been popping it yeah. up on the video below you so that people know where to go. Or if people go to the show notes at behindtheshot.tv, or if they drop down into the uh, description area on YouTube. All of Will's links are there. If you go to Instagram and check out Will on Instagram, which is really easy, it's at Will Kadena, uh, C-A-D-E-N-A, uh, W-I-L-L, by the way, for Will, in case you didn't know. Uh, if you go look at who he's following, you'll find some great photographers. So with that in mind, your website is what? 
It's willkadena.com. If you just type in Google, I should pop up everywhere. I hope so, with SEO. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely you know, check us out. Um, we'll be speaking at upcoming conferences and workshops. So um, I feel like I'm teaching more about business these days. Uh, I love business. And, and even when I teach photo walks, I also teach business at the same time when I'm teaching those photo walks as well. So Okay, yeah. and then... Uh, yeah. Instagram, Twitter, and Vimeo are at Will Kadena, but Facebook is different. It's at Will Kadena Photography. Yeah. So yeah. go give Will some love. Follow him. Subscribe to all his channels on Vimeo and wherever. And uh, dude, I just, I love your work. I, again, I appreciate you it, have this, you have this sense of openness in your shots that makes me feel like I'm entering a scene physically, like I'm there and... And to me, that's something I really greatly appreciate. So, so thanks. Thank you, man. I love wide angle shots. I love to feel like you're there. That's one of them. one of my favorite. Still to this day, is the the Canon EF 11, uh, 11 to twenty four f four. So that's still one of Ooh, my ideal nice lens. lenses. Really, yeah. really, really nice yeah. lens. I'm yeah. Glad and I never can, sold it. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. need something like that. Like I've got on the on the RF. Uh, I've got the fifteen to thirty five, which I love. Of course. But I'd love like an eleven millimeter and an RF. Love it. That do would you be, have the polar? Do you have the polarizers? Have you been using them or no? I do not. I because I, I don't shoot that type of thing very much. Oh, that's true too. Yeah, I yeah, love that yeah. feature, man. But yeah, that's really again cool. Yeah. Thank you so much to my guest this time around, Will Kadena. Uh, appreciate him being here so much. And you can follow him at willkadena.com, at Will Kadena on all the socials except Facebook, where it's at Will Kadena Photography. As usual, if you want to follow me or the podcast. My personal site is stevebrazel.com, like the country of Brazil, but two L's. Uh, the website for the podcast is behindtheshot.tv. If you want to follow me on social media, I've kind of abandoned Facebook, but the pages are still there for Behind the Shot TV. Uh, or Twitter and Instagram, it's Behind the Shot TV or Steve Brazel anywhere for social media. And again, if you're on YouTube, if you would, please head down. If you like what you saw, drop a like. Drop a comment, whatever you want to do. Uh, subscribe if you would. And wherever you get the podcast, again, I, I got to stress this. It really does help with discovery if you would leave a written review in, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, as a lot of people still call it, or wherever you get your podcasts. It would be very, very much appreciated. Again, to everybody, thanks for joining us. Join us next time as we take a look inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you soon. <laughs>